Remember when I told you back in chapter one that nanotechnology could really be divided into two kinds of nanotechnology? You had flask nano in a jar, basically, where you have little particles floating around. And then you have, and this flask nano would be useful in vaccine formulations, nanoparticle drug delivery, various uh, coatings and paints and optical coatings and stuff. And then you have wafer nano and wafer nano is nanotechnology that's done on a wafer. And that is synonymous with the microelectronics industry and microfabrication. Now, similarly, the techniques used to make flask nano often are um, made using bottom-up approaches and techniques to make a wafer nano are often made using top-down approaches and not but not always those aren't hard and fast rules it's just you know statistically more likely now what do i mean by bottom up and top down so bottom up means that you don't really have to do anything after you design the particle from which the whole three-dimensional or two-dimensional structure is made, you're done because you put that stuff in and it happens kind of, um, kind of <laughs> um, by itself. And that means um, self-assembly. And so uh, other forms of bottom-up synthesis include chemical synthesis of larger structures from smaller precursors and also additive manufacturing where you use for example extrusion based fuse deposition molding techniques to generate complexity from a relatively simple starting material namely a piece of thermoplastic cord that is run through the extruder Top-down techniques tend to be more uh, more subtractive. So it's like a marble sculpture. You hack away at the marble and then you reveal the, uh, the Michelangelo's David <laughs> inside, or we don't, but Michelangelo did. It's like chiseling. It's, uh, it's synonymous with fabrication as opposed to self-assembly. Um, it uses hard materials often as opposed to soft materials. And it is uh, the highest bit of sophistication is sort of embodied in microelectronics fabrication, whereas for bottom up, the highest proof of principle bit of sophistication is definitely in biology, right? Like all of this is self-assembled uh, uh, structures, so cell membranes, proteins, and so on. In fact, if you take a, another look at what a polypeptide is right here, you can see that it is an example of many different kinds of self-assembled structures. So you have alpha helices and, uh, and beta sheets and actually all of those interior hydrophobic uh, residues, they all end up there because of, uh, to a zeroth order approximation, they end up there because of the hydro hydrophobic uh, forces. And then the charged and polar residues kind of point toward the outside, so protein self-assembled structures. Some important uh, human-made structures include micelles, and you've all made micelles today if you washed your hands or brushed your teeth. There are, uh, and the, the critical feature of a micelle is that it's charged head groups of these little amphiphilic molecules are pointing out toward the water, and these sort of greasy hydrocarbon chains are pointing out, pointing inward, um, and that's what happens in an aqueous environment. Suppose you put the same structures in an organic solvent, you might get an inverted micelle where the uh, floppy organic part is pointing outward and the charged part are, the charged parts, assuming you have counter ions in there, are, um, to balance the electric charge are actually more comfortable being uh, associated with themselves to uh, increase the uh, electrostatic benefit or decrease the electrostatic self-energy. If you have different kinds of structures that are say more, uh, more cylindrical based, then they might form something called a bilayer vesicle. And uh, usually this is like a, a phospholipid bilayer is an example of a bilayer vesicle, a liposome, which might've delivered your mRNA 
vaccine if you got one, um, got an mRNA vaccine, uh, was probably delivered in a liposome um, as well. And here is a structure of a typical amphiphile called sodium dodecyl sulfate, which consists of a hydrophilic head group and a hydrophobic tail. Synthesis is sometimes considered a bottom-up process. Well, it's not a self-assembly process. It's always a bottom-up process. And that's where you take structures that, uh, you take atoms and molecules and things that you can buy in a catalog and you mix them together in the right ratio, and then you get, uh, you get higher order structures. So we can synthesize polymers, quantum dots. There are structures called, uh, called dendromers. Dendromers are examples of branched polymers where you sort of start with a, in this case uh, shown here, a three-pronged A uh, terminated group, then you bond that to these, uh, these branched um, B groups that are where the A groups are, are protected on this reactant, then you deprotect them, then you um, react them with another B, A prime, A prime group, and then you build up the complexity like this, and you get this like three dimensional snowflake that kind of reminds me of a spherulite, but it's not exactly the same thing. The nice thing about dendromers is they contain voids in them where you can encapsulate drug molecules or other types of payloads. One nice example of a self-assembled structure that is really useful in nanotechnology is that of a self-assembled monolayer. Now, self-assembled monolayers are used, um, and I should say monomers of all, or sorry, monolayers of all kinds are used ubiquitously. So if you look at, the, at your smartphone or if you're watching this video on a tablet or even probably your laptop screen, um, especially if it's a touch interactive laptop screen, has a monolayer of a uh, fluorinated polymer on it that resists smudging and makes it easier for you to glide your finger across because it has um, very low surface energy, very low van der Waals coefficient with your fingertip. And there's another type of monolayer called a self-assembled monolayer, uh, which is based on the interaction of sulfur with coinage metals uh, or noble metals like gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and to a lesser extent copper. And these sulfur atoms can stick to with a bond strength of almost a covalent bond. And uh, you can use those structures as handles to grow polymers off of or you can bind biomolecules to them or anything you might want to do especially if the gold is a nanoparticle so for example um, certain types of lateral flow assays again for uh, COVID-19 rapid tests are uh, are made using this way and that's actually a nice segue into the uh, field of nanomedicine and in particular uh, nano cancer therapy so much of nanomedicine is uh, is derived uh, or is was created on the basis of making better drug delivery nano uh, particles for the treatment of cancer. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, a naked drug molecule tends to um, tends to have not great bioavailability because it might not be soluble uh, in the bloodstream. They might it might be a hydrophobic drug. Um, it might be toxic to non-cancer cells, and uh, furthermore, the release profile is not great. If you just inject a drug directly, you get all that blasted in the bloodstream at once. It could lead to uh, serious health problems. These problems can be mitigated, or the, the belief is they can be mitigated in many cases successfully by using nanoparticles as delivery agents because you can control the concentration of the particles, you can control where they go, you can control the release rate of the nanoparticles in principle, and that is called the pharmacokinetics, um, and, uh, and you can make them more effective um, overall. One of the ways that the uh, that the that nanomedicine for drug delivery works is using the uh, principle of the enhanced. 
um, retention, enhanced permeability and retention effect, where basically a tumor is made of, uh, is vascularized by kind of a shoddy home job uh, plumbing where the capillaries in the tumor cell are leaky. So nanoparticles will automatically kind of leak out and find the uh, tumor tissue. At least that's what is, uh, what's believed, but the, that effect is a bit, um, is a bit controversial. There are other ways of targeting nanoparticles to the sites. For example, you can bind ligands or molecules to the surface of the nanoparticles that specifically will attach themselves to cells that express genes indicative of being a tumor. Um, so different proteins will be expressed on the surface of tumor cells and also the tumor microenvironment like the pH or perhaps even the temperature um, will be different and they can trigger the, uh, the explosion or delivery of a, uh, of a nanoparticle. And if you take like polymer nanoparticles, there are a few different ways of getting drugs out of them. You can have a diffusion controlled mechanism, an erosion controlled mechanism, or a, uh, or a, or a burst release mechanism, which is usually treated as undesirable. So burst release, uh, you will always get physisorption from uh, of drug molecules to a nanoparticle, and those drug molecules on the surface will just kind of come off as soon as they're injected, and that the amount of drug molecules on the surface will actually scale with the surface area to volume ratio, which as we know from chapter 10, scales with one over R, the radius of the nanoparticle. So the smaller the particle gets, the more likely the burst release is to happen, which can really wreak havoc with your drug delivery profile. Nanoparticles are also, of course, useful for delivering therapeutics for uh, vaccines, like such as vaccines, and they're also useful for, uh, for imaging. So, for example, you can have contrast agents for a variety of uh, techniques like MRI, like ultrasound, like uh, CT scans where you might inject nanoparticles that will find the area of interest and that will help you get a better uh, image that is more informational and can lead to uh, better conclusions. We'll pick up uh, next time with nanocharacterization techniques.